Strip everything down to image, word, idea. Without narrative, it means nothing. This is MJ. I'm an author, I'm an artist, I'm an analyzer. Find all my work at mjmunoz.com. Welcome to Super Sentai Sanctuary. Join me as I analyze Avatar Sentai Dawn Brothers, episode three. I'm going to be discussing, is this show hinting that the Dawn Brothers are not human? So, uh, Avatar Sentai Dawn Brothers number three uh, is entitled either The Light Thief or The Lamp Thief, depending on which translation you're going with. Uh, I guess I'm, uh, I got, well, I won't say who I got for uh, the sake of disclo- uh, uh, discretion, that's what I meant to say. Anyway, uh, it originally aired March 20th, 2022. The writer is Toshiki Inoue, the head writer of the series. The director is Sojiro Nakazawa, and I am going to be doing a creator spotlight on Nakazawa after uh, the main topic. So, here we go. I'm about to get into it. I've got one negative thing about this episode. Uh, really, I did not get to watch this in the same way I did the last two, so this may be, this will either be an aberration or it'll be exactly setting the tone for how the rest of the, my analysis of this series will go, uh, assuming I stick with it, which I think I will because it seems uh, pretty, pretty good so far. Anyway, uh, negative thing, mistaken identity to the nth degree. I cannot believe that Toshiki Inoue had the audacity to set up a situation where Haruka is hanging around, hanging out, tooling around with, uh, <laughs> what is it, Momo? Yeah, Momoi, Momoi Taro, not looking at the dude's name badge, and she asks him, "Have you, it's like the Obi-Wan thing, have you ever heard of Obi-Wan Kenobi? Well, of course I can, you know, he's me, or, you know, of course, yeah, I've heard of him, he's me. It's like, wow, really? We didn't even get the he's me, I expected it, like, yeah, that's me, girl, like, I got you, don't worry about this, you know, anything you need, um, I'm gonna memo your. T- no, that doesn't make sense. Anyway, I thought he would just like volunteer that it was him, but the way she asked the question, he answered it extremely literally, which is kind of in keeping, kind of in line with what he did, where Sana A was asking him how old she looked in the previous episode, and he kept telling her 68, no matter how youthful she looked, until the very end when she had had this transformation, this interior transformation, which I meant to mention last time, but I didn't really get to talk about, where he said at the end, you look like you're 68 years old, but you're full of energy and full of zeal for life. Now, why is it that having the monster removed from her fixed her problems and made her feel so much better and caused her to have an attitude adjustment when it was not the monster that caused the problem in the first place. It was the monster that seized upon the problem and fueled itself off of her anxieties in order to empower itself and, uh, and, and, and I don't know, do what, but it, you know, use that as the fuel for, of its parasitic, uh, it was its parasite food basically as it enacted uh, a parasitic relationship with her. So gosh, I hadn't thought about that before. Huh? Anyway, um, I just, uh, I'm a little bit, unsure why he would do that getting back to the point and I don't know why Inoue would do that but it wasn't all bad like there something interesting came out of it something good came out of it but I just find it frustrating the way I don't know I find the idea of it frustrating but I like the execution of it I guess I'll put it that way so it's just it's odd and maybe if he wasn't like known for doing this it would be less of a problem, and like the way it worked out in Kiva was beautiful, and I loved it. (laughs) Oh man, I love Kiva so much. Anyway, and uh, yeah, I I really don't know what to say. So that's my negative thing. I've got a few positive things. The first one is, uh, Taro has a strong hint of personality and characterization. Him becoming incensed at the Black Bear Bandit and his confrontation with him uh, and the White Knight Lady uh, related to him show some texture to his character. I think that's a good thing. That's more something I'm listing than something I'm explaining. Uh, With that, I'll say um, that Haruka take the wheel moment was great. And uh, I now see the utility of the Little Peach. I really didn't get it before. I didn't know what they were doing with Little Peach. You know, Big Peach, Little Peach, Momotaro going to the little robot version of himself or whatever. Uh, but it totally, uh, <laughs> it could be useful. So that, that was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I, w- it was cool that she took the wheel, that Haruka took the wheel. But it's silly and dumb that I guess we're assuming uh, Taro's foot stayed on the gas. Or maybe he pulled it off and she had to pull over in order to get parked somewhere safe so they didn't crash. I don't know. Um, but it was uh, it was a great moment, and it was kind of exhilarating to watch the little uh, Peach Robot attack the... Uh, um, 
the the truck or the van and disable it that was that was pretty dope so i did like that um yeah i other than stating the the fact that um well i guess i'm gonna address what am i gonna address I don't know. I'm just going to keep reading through my notes. I'm not going to go back over the positive thing about uh, Taru, Taru's uh, characterization because I don't think I need to. Uh, move on to talk about direction. Uh, Momotaro versus White Knight was really cool. I liked the use of explosions uh, in the fight. Uh, I think it was just the once, but it was still done really well. It was a very dynamic fight. Uh, I thought it was interesting that she, like, I guess she's got technically, like, her changer. I noticed this. Her changer, like, goes onto her chest as, like, a piece of chest armor. And I would assume it's the same with the Blue Knight and the... I think he's brown. I mean, he's supposed to be yellow or, or orange or something, but he looks brown. Anyway, or maybe he's a gold knight. I don't know. But anyway, um, and they're all like Sunoi and Sunuzi and Sawawa or so, I don't know. All their names have an S and sound like, and I think they're three syllables. So it'll take me a while to get used to them and then to not confuse them with each other. But um, if they were Sonoma, Sedona, and uh, I don't know, that's a stupid joke. Um, I, I drive a minivan because I've got a bunch of kids. So uh, we have a... Well, anyway, we have one of those. Um, moving on. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was really cool, I guess, getting back, backtracking. I thought it was really cool that she used, like, her chest uh, armor, her chest plate to, like, bop the sword out of the way to, uh, like, gain an advantage on uh, Momotaro. That was uh, pretty cool to see. And uh, just the fights are really interesting. Um, and I'm really enjoying how... I don't know how dynamic and, and different they are, uh, I guess from what I'm used to, it's, although it's also been a while since I've seen, so if there's been like a gradual, um, not translation, a gradual growth or, or transformation or evolution in the fighting style as, you know, different people have taken over from, you know, you, you learn from your sensei, then you become the sensei, and so you change things up. Um, you know, that would, that would make sense, but I've, I've seen like a gap I've seen a jump in evolution of the fight scenes if in fact, uh, or the, I guess the fight choreography, if in fact we do get a progression from show to show. Like, um, for example, from Gokaiger to Go Busters, Gokaiger Dawn, uh, Gokai Green Dawn, uh, became Gokai Red, or not Gokai Red, uh, became uh, Red Buster, and he, Dawn had a crazy, st I loved watching Dawn, uh, any scene with Dawn transformed and doing his shtick was fabulous and uh i didn't expect a one-to-one -one. i didn't expect uh, red buster to be goofy uh, but he did get to be a little bit goofy uh for a while and uh you know like being scared of the chicken and stuff but i think it was actually mostly the actor who was doing stuff out of suit uh, but anyway my point is he had a very different feel a very different energy from uh, like gokai red for instance and then that was uh, you know red buster had that energy and now i want to look back and i'm going to soon do a spotlight on this red ranger to see who he is and who he's portrayed in the past because i'm almost wondering with the amount of acrobatics the amount of energy he has it feels like it might be uh that guy who took over uh from being green and gokai to being red and go busters and then possibly you know continued on from there um which gosh his athleticism is really impressive um Yeah, I don't know why I got off on a tangent about Dawn. I totally forgot my point, and uh, I got a pause. So <laughs> I'll be right back, and I will pick up talking about something from the writing of the show. Okay, picking it back up, and I want to know why Inoue writes like this, man. Uh, so was there some other way for Haruka to have gotten close to Taro other than hanging out on his route because he didn't tell her that he was Momori Taro? And that that was the reason why he had never delivered a package to Momori Taro? Because why would you deliver a package to yourself when you can just take receipt of it and then be done with it? Which is a ridiculous, like, semantic BS, you know, whatever. Uh, I, I, I just don't, I don't know. But anyway, like, I wonder if, if, I feel like Inoue writes like a troll. And he just loves doing stuff that's kind of irritating and you want to hate him for it. But it's like, you know what? You actually did a pretty good job at that. So, I don't know why you chose to do it that way. But if you must paint, you know, the house by standing on your hands and using your feet, do it. You, you did it just as fast as somebody standing on their feet and using their hands, but I don't know why you would do that. And that's kind of what he seems to be like sometimes. Anyway, moving on uh, to reflections to try to close things out here. Uh, Taro tells Haruka, I don't hit people after he flicks nuts at some toughs attacking her. This is while they're on his route. Uh, later on, he fiercely attacks the white knight lady. 
After she is gone, the White Knight Lady, he attacks the rest of the Don Brothers, Don Brothers rather, but it feels somewhere uh, between his attacks on uh, foes and lively sparring, and it's hard to read the situation. And it's played for laughs too. It's not like he's, you know, it's not like <laughs> like Black Hazard in uh, in Kamen Rider Build. It's not like that, you know. Um, so I just I don't know what's going on there. And then what's the last thing? Okay, yeah, yeah. So keeping those factors in mind, uh, could these be hints that Don Brothers are not, or the Don Brothers are not, or are no longer human? And what are the implications of that? And what is their true identity? So how and why am I going off on this possibility of them not being human? Well, he says he doesn't attack people or he doesn't hit people. So, you know, that's why he flicked the nuts at the guys. Um, but he also is questionably human like it's very possible that momotaro is not a human uh kind of like how in and i don't remember how they address this in the legend of momotaro other than you know he, he comes out of the giant peach so he's peach boy but uh in the legend of princess kaguya i believe she is a angelic heavenly divine moon whatever she's a, a, another being from another plane she's not human and she goes back home spoilers she goes back home at the end by the way if you haven't seen the ghibli uh kaguya movie you should it's really good anyway um but yeah kaguya goes back home because she's not of this world <laughs> i can't believe i just said that uh she's not of this world she's uh, you know a, 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 a goddess or a whatever a kamu it's the same thing anyway so she goes back to her world and that's it. So is Momotaro going to have to go back to his world? Is, or, you know, Momotaro going to have to go back to his world at some point at the end of the story? Uh, you know, is he not human? Are these other people not human like him? Is that why they were chosen? Because somebody is doing the choosing here. Someone has dropped, someone dropped the phone in front of, I can't remember Saru's full name, but Saru something other. Uh, somebody dropped the phone in his path. He picked it up and uh, utilized it or you know the eye came out the glasses came on him because of his exposure to the phone but I kind of get the uh, impression that he doesn't carry a phone on his own if he's because he certainly doesn't carry money anyway uh, I'm just really curious as to as to you know what that is we don't know who the villain groups are we don't know what they're doing we don't know if they're supposed to be two different races of monsters or yokai or some sort of you know kaiju or just Kaijin or, or what they're supposed to be so it's very difficult to know and understand what exactly is going on here and we are only three episodes in and unlike other shows that I've been frustrated with it uh, with lack of information this is going somewhere and I feel like the writers or you know Inoue and the crew know where this is going so I have faith and I have confidence that it's going to be good and interesting and uh, well formulated uh, but just, uh, and, and this is not frustration. This is me just wondering what are the broader implications. And maybe because I've seen things like uh, Kiva, um, as well as, uh, well, I've seen a bunch of Rider. I've seen a few Sentai and tons of Power Rangers. So um, maybe, and Power Rangers writing is less, you know, one of these things is not like the other, and it's Power Rangers writing. It's not so much like the Kamen Rider or Super Sentai writing. But uh, regardless, it's still Tokusatsui and it's still inspired by, ooh. By that stuff so I'm trying to figure out what uh, what it could be based on what I've seen before so anyway like I said trying to work that out trying to look ahead and see what impressions not impressions what hints are here for us as the audience to pick up on and anyway I just uh, I'm, I'm curious to see where it's going I wonder if we're gonna find out that the Don brothers part of what they've lost is their humanity and uh, Momotaro is gonna help them get it back Maybe that's what's going to happen. I don't know. So I have a bunch of general notes. Not a bunch. I have a few general notes that you can check out uh, on the show notes. There's some other things I didn't quite go over. And there's going to be some details from the uh, creator spotlight or highlight that I'm going to be doing. Spotlight? I think it's a spotlight. Anyway, there's going to be some details from there that I don't share with you right now. So I'm going to let you know the next episode, which will be coming out very soon after this episode releases, this review, this analysis releases, is going to be uh, Onigiri Rice Balls. That is what it's called. So we've got flicking nuts at people and we've got Onigiri Rice Balls. So anyway, kind of funny, kind of immature, kind of enjoyable. Anyway, uh, so the creator spotlight for this week, for this episode, and I don't know that this will be possible to do every single week. We'll see how it goes. I might stretch it out, make a meal out of it. It could be kind of fun to do that. Uh, is going to be on director Shoji, oh, so, sorry, Sho, Shojiro, whew, 
Shojiro Nakazawa. So, uh, he was born December 29, 1971, making him 50 years old today. According to the wiki, he celebrated his 42nd birthday while directing Tokyuju's first episode. And uh, I appreciate a man who doesn't take the day off for his birthday, because I usually don't do that either. I was told to recently by my boss, but uh, kind of odd. Anyway, moving on from there, uh, he's done a bunch of Super Sentai. He's mainly a Super Sentai director. I don't know anything that's not Super Sentai that he has directed. He did a bunch of Super Sentai movies, which I did not include in this list. Uh, I don't know why I didn't, but um, I'm going to just... I highlighted a few of his uh, series that he's done, and I'm going to talk about them, and I'm going to talk about, talk about one in particular, um, and I'm going to give them to you in chronological order of when the shows came out, therefore when he directed them and worked on them. So... Um, in the year 2000, between 2000 and 2001, when he was 30 years old, that's impressive, he was directing, or he was, I believe, he was either an assistant director or a director hired on to do a whole thing, one episode of Mirai Sentai Time Ranger, or Future Sentai Time Ranger. Then later on in 2005 to 2006, so four years later, or five years later, I guess, uh, he was the, or yeah, he was the main director for Jukken Sentai Geki Ranger, and he directed 12 of those episodes. No, only six of those episodes himself. So I don't know how you can be the series director and only, um, I'm sorry, it was 12. Go Ranger was six. I was reading that, or Go Ranger was six. I was reading that wrong. Anyway, so 12 episodes, that's uh, roughly a quarter. I could see, I could see that working out. You, I, I don't know if you do that and then you, if you're like the executive director, so you tell everybody else how to direct their scenes or give them ideas or talk to them about what they're gonna do. You set the style and then maintain it. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, next, uh, the next one he directed was four years later, Samurai Sentai Shinkinger. He did 12 episodes of that as the main director. And then he went on to work on Kazuko Sentai Go Kaiger. He did, let's see, 1, 2, 7, 8, 15, 16, 19, 20, 27, 28. He directed 10 episodes on that. And <coughs> I got to say, if he was the guy who invented or created the concept of the Gokaiju throwing their weapons back and forth to each other, this man is special. <laughs> I know that sounds ridiculous, and I found a little, feel a little embarrassed saying that, but for what he does for his field, for his industry, he's doing special things. He's doing some incredible stuff, and uh, I think it's really fantastic. So, um, the dynamism and the energy, the cool factor, the swagger, the personal... I just went off talking about Dawn for like, I don't know, three or four minutes out of this hopefully less than 20 minute long analysis from an entirely different show who didn't appear in this show because of how much I liked him uh, and how he was directed and that has to I would imagine at least be partially uh, due to the work of uh, Nakazawa here um, so anyway that's uh, that's what I have to say Gokaiger was was boss like just watch the first episode just just skip all the dialogue skip all the like if you can only find like clips from the first episode of Gokaiger uh, it's like their second, it's their big fight when they're interrupted from eating curry, I think, in the restaurant. It's amazing. It, it'll blow your mind. I'm not overselling it. It may sound like I'm overselling it, and I'm usually against people hyping things because the hype level, the expectation level, you know, if you keep your expectations low, you'll never be disappointed. That's something I've heard all my life, and I almost live my life by that. But, or, so, I'm not one to overhype things when they shouldn't be. Go watch that. In fact, I'm going to watch that later. <laughs> Because it's so good. Anyway, um, then the next thing he uh, was the head director of was, oh boy, 1, 2, 11, 12, 22, 23, 31, 36, 46, 47. Only 10 episodes of Ninja, which may or may not have been a shorter season. I don't know. Uh, then it's unclear to me whether or not Nakazawa was the lead director of Zen Kaiger and this uh, Power Rangers wiki, Power Rangers fandom wiki is the only one, for some reason it's the only thing coming up in my results. And... Uh, uh, at least on this particular search engine and it says he directed the first two episodes of Zenkaiger. It seems to me like uh, lead directors or series directors usually direct the first two episodes and then and same thing with the writers. They'll write the first two or so episodes and then it'll go to other people, you know, like they set the tone and then other people take it up and run with it and that's generally what it seems like to me is the case. So he very well may be the guy on Zenkaiger, uh, but I can't quite tell. So Anyway, that would be interesting, especially because that was the previous show, so you wouldn't think he would be doing it, although with the similarities between the two shows, it, there could be something there. 
So that big list I went over of Nakazawa's, uh, the shows that he's directed on, there were 19 of them. Zen, uh, not Zen Kaijo, sheesh. This one, whatever this one's called, would be the 20th one. Why don't I know the name of it? Because it's weird. Avatar Sentai or Avatar Sentai Don Brothers. Whew, there we go. So Don Brothers is his 20th Super Sentai series he's directing. Again, I don't know what else he did before this, but that's a lot of Super Sentai. And uh, that's that's crazy. That's 20 years worth of, or 19, 20 years worth of shows that he's been directing on and that he's been working with, which makes sense that he's 50 years old now and he started when he was 30 on Time Ranger. That's that's incredible. Anyway, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, was there anything special about the directing in this episode? You know what? I don't know. I got to go back over and look at my note real quick in the direction. No, just I mentioned I like the Momotaro and, um, and White Knight fight. And, you know, honestly, with the explosions, it did feel a little Power Rangers-y to me. Uh, I think Power Rangers has some awesome fights. In the earlier years, I think I like the civilian fights best or better than the Ranger fights. Uh, to some extent, well, I don't know, maybe it's more exciting. I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, in some of the later stuff, I don't know. I can't... Well, Jungle Fury has awesome fights. Um, I can't remember what else. I've kind of been watching a smattering of some of the other Ranger shows. Like uh, my kids watching the... Not the Ryu Soldier one, but the uh, Dino Charge. Yeah, yeah, Dino Charge, which is off of Q-Ranger. Um, or Kill Ruger, I'm sorry. And that's pretty cool. Um, but I don't know how much the footage is Japanese versus American. Uh, but still, the, like, at least Koichi Sakamoto's stuff. I guess some of his stuff that he's doing, Nakazawa, in this episode, like, specifically in that uh, White Knight uh, fight um, at the end there between her and Momotaro's, or Momotaro, uh, felt maybe, like, Sakamoto-ish, except for not fetishy. So that was that was pretty good. So, anyway, I think, I'm, I, think I very much enjoy his work. So... I will probably go ahead and close out now because that's about all I had to say. Uh, check out mgmunoz.com for more of my stuff. Uh, I'm going to be consistent with this show as long as it's good, as long as I'm enjoying it. I'm going to keep uh, talking about it and analyzing it and um, enjoying uh, Inoue's trollish writing. So, uh, and the, the like dynamic, super fun um, uh, direction. Um, Oh, there was another thing. Well, yeah, you should only check out the show notes because there's other stuff that I didn't mention just for the sake of time. And uh, anyway, you might enjoy that too. So uh, I did make a meme. The The thumbnail for this episode is basically a meme. And uh, I will reproduce it and replicate it other places other than here on the show. I'll put it over on Float and on MeWe. And I might even throw it up on my TikTok. Um, although I was thinking about cutting doing like a video, like clipping the video from the different sections of the show so I can make that a little video meme, like real short, you know, 15 seconds or so would work uh, to get everything in. Because uh, it's really funny that uh, the episode's named I Don't Hit People. That seemed like a really profound part of the show. Uh, it was a really profound, you know, point on a scene. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, he's whacking his, uh, his folks around. So that was pretty funny. Um, but I think there's a point to it. I don't think it's just silly or like, I don't think it's dumb and I don't think it's, just a joke. I think there's something to it, which is why I said, does this imply that these guys aren't actually humans anymore or ever were or whatever. So anyway, with that, I'm officially closing out. Check out all my stuff at mgmunos.com. Uh, check out all of my other analysis work. Uh, I'm waiting for Comrade Black Sun. I don't know when it's coming out. Futo PD or Futo PI or whatever is also coming out. PD. Futo PI. <coughs> is going to be coming out, so I'll be covering that too. It's uh, I'm going to be a busy guy, so uh, stick around. If you enjoy my work, you can get way more of it, and if you want to support me, uh, you can do that over at mgmunos.com. You can find different ways to support me so that I can do way more of this and uh, and go beyond um, and do a bunch more stuff besides just uh, analyzing stuff. I can get working on creating things and making them really awesome, inspired by the stuff that you love, inspired by the stuff that I love. Anyway, this is MJ signing out. I leave you with peace and blessings.